Okay, it's uh, one o'clock. Uh, welcome to the Documentary Media Centre. I'm John, it's Tina. Um, welcome to, well, I don't know, we're the last year in lockdown. It's been a bit weird, a bit strange. I remember you saying right at the beginning, we need to turn it inside out and start broadcasting and turn the museum into somewhere that we need to be doing stuff. So what's your view of the last 12 months been? It's been a bit of a, a bit of a whirlwind to tell you the truth, but I've actually enjoyed innovating and thinking differently about the way in which we engage and interact with our clients and our partners and organisations. So for me, I think it's been quite interesting. I've enjoyed it. Yeah, I, rem I remember just before lockdown, we had a, a planning meeting and we were talking about all the things that we were going to do over the summer, all the repertoire club events, all of the exhibitions we have planned, all of the Saturday morning Doc Explorers clubs here. And literally the whole thing got thrown out, didn't it? And I remember feeling a little bit sort of down about it because it was like, we've put so much time and effort in the previous six months into doing it. Um, and you said, well, you know, the only thing we can do really is just turn it inside out and use the spaces to broadcast out as opposed to inviting people in and I guess after a couple of 24-hour newsrooms and they're running regular newsrooms for different people that we know across the city and county it seems to be the right thing to have done. Yeah I think that attitude was actually has kind of left us in good stead we are you know we've had a really good year we've done some great projects you know we've actually been able to kind of support organisations mm -hmm um throughout the last 14 months as well which has been really really interesting so I, i've i've enjoyed it i don't you know i'm not saying that everybody's enjoyed the last 14 months but i'm quite excited about the innovation and the ideas and the future ways of thinking people have come up with and that that's what excites me i know we can it's it's easy to dwell on the negatives of something like a pandemic or the impact of you know, a business or a venue not being open, but actually what's gone on behind the scenes? What what have they been thinking about? What's changed? What have they put into place to kind of future proof themselves? And I think that that's that's what I that's what excites me. Cool. So we were talking about having our own event, talking about the Dot Media Centre. And then obviously the International Museum Day today has presented itself as an ideal opportunity for us to talk about some of the projects that we're doing and stuff and, and, and maybe a lot of people might not know but the dot media center is actually a registered independent museum and archive or independent museum with um, aim the association of independent museums and it has been since 2014 yeah. i think we did the first pop-up um 30-day dot media center when we ran the watt space at, yeah. at, at the high cross and so i think we've done between five it's five or six pop-ups and then the opportunity came to use uh, 14 Northampton Street, where we are, between Char uh, Granby Street and Charles Street. I'll get confused, um, having our own sort of permanent, permanent space. Um, and so today's really an ideal opportunity, not only to mark the fact that well, we're still here, we're still going, but also to talk about some of these projects that, that we've been involved in and stuff. So obviously today's theme for International Museum Day is the future of museums, recover and reimagine, and it just seemed to sit, uh, seem to fit very well with some of the projects that we've been working on, particularly over the last sort of six to seven months, um, and some of the things that we've got coming up as well. So uh, we're going to talk a little bit about why heritage, which I'll talk to you about now. Um, then we're going to talk about digital personas, and then we've got two interviews that have been done by two of our young digital creators. Um, Peter's going to be interviewed at the Loughborough Carillon by Bethany, which will play. Um, and then um, Lucy interviewed Tom at Moira Furness. Um, and then we're going to talk a little bit about uh, the next project we've got with those guys uh, in the city and the county. Um, and then at two o'clock, we're going to play the interview with Claire Brown, who is the Regional Museum Development Manager at MDEM, which is the Museum Development East Midlands. Um, and then once we've finished that, I want to talk to you and finish off uh, a little bit about the new content management system that we've been developing called Museo. So I'm really excited about that. That's really good. I'm looking forward to hearing for that. That's the first time most people will have heard what we're going to be talking about. So talk to me a little bit about um, the Why Heritage Project and, and what we've been doing um, with those guys since uh, September, October time last year. 
So um, during September last year, we actually started working with heritage, um, our heritage partners, Y Heritage, um, over at the YMCA on the Heritage Lottery Funded Project, which in a nutshell, um, Y Heritage Kick the Dust Project. It's a great name though, when you yeah, think about it, it, for young people getting involved yeah. in heritage. It's like catchphrase, says what it is, says exactly what it is. It's about young people getting the opportunity to kick the dust off with heritage. <laughs> you know, really creative project. Um, <clears throat> the Y Heritage is just one of a number of kick the dust projects um, across the UK. They're heritage, heritage lottery funded projects, which I mentioned, and their ethos is to, I would say, take and work with young people who are on the fringes of society. That's their bag, working with a particular type of young person who would never in their normal day think about this in a museum or heritage location. So actually, over the last year, we've worked with the guys at the YMCA in Leicester and their Y Heritage Project to kind of help and get involved in this way of working to engage museum and heritage locations to actually look at the way in which they currently engage young people and actually work with them on coming up with ideas and engagement opportunities which for a lot of them, by the very nature of the way they're managed, means that working with young people is almost aspirational or comes with quite a lot of baggage or quite a lot of uncertainty and fear. So it's been quite interesting. So um, over the last year, we've worked with Hayley, um, who's part of the Y Heritage team and um, other members of staff, but in particular, um, the Digital Persona Project, I've been working alongside Hayla um, and we've been recruiting young people who are actively been matched to a number of museums across Leicester and Leicestershire to create and design a digital platform to bring artifacts and objects alive. So for anybody who's thinking, what the heck what is the Tina persona? talking about right now? <laughs> what is a digital so, persona? The concept I always say with digital persona is think about the dinosaur at New York Museum with its own Instagram platform. You know, think about your favorite object or visitor attraction being brought to life through its own platform um, creatively and actually having that platform managed by a young person who is then coming up with ideas of competitions to engage schools and campaigns that they could run that link the object with a particular awareness week or a campaign. So it's been really, really exciting. And when I first designed and came up with the concept for the project, I just actually thought to myself, oh, you know, we'll get some, like you say, objects, vases, you know, <laughs> dinosaurs. Well, I always thought of the face on the Picasso plate at the New York, New York Museum, that kind of bringing the animation, that kind yes. of stuff. And we've not really had any kind of thought process about that at all, has it? It's been full on. Well, the young people that have actually ended up getting involved in the project, they have really ran and shaped the individual projects in with their own strengths and interest areas. So we've got, so basically what we've done is we've recruited nine young people, all of which have been matched to a museum or heritage location. And they are working with museum staff and volunteers to actually home in and um, kind of identify a particular object. And this is where it gets exciting. So just for instance, we'll hear a little bit about this. Um, we'll touch on it as the newsroom goes on, I'm sure. But, you know, at some museums, it's a jug, it's an item. Um, at the Carillon in Loughborough, it is actually the physical building, you know, and with the museum and library service out in Harborough, you know, there's two digital personas out there, and one of them's actually a cabinet in the library, which um, Holly, our digital curator, has come up with a wealth of ideas of schools taking over the cabinet, poetry competitions, linking it in with their summer reading challenge. So these young people have really kind of ran with these opportunities and it's really kind of excited the venues that we've been working with. 
So in a nutshell, um, we designed the Digital Personas project as a way of supporting young people to help kick the dust, get involved in museum and heritage locations in a real creative way, and actually to help these individual locations reimagine and rethink their digital offer and the way in which they can enhance the visitor experience for not only physical visitors, but actually those digital visitors that are actually visiting venues from their sofas at home now. Um, so yeah, it's been really, really exciting. Um, we, I would say we are actually coming up probably towards um, the last four or five months of the project and in various um, locations and stages, um, there's some great things happening out there, which people are more than able to kind of keep up to date with by following the what space social media platforms keeping in touch with the documentary media center we're always posting and updating um, what our digital curators are up to and over the next few weeks well over the next i would say six to eight weeks in particular the digital persona projects are going to be there's going to be lots of activity linked to them because they're planned activity and and some additional things that we can talk yeah. about later as well, which they're going to be doing as well. Um, so let, let's just use the opportunity before we play the first interview by um, Bethany with um, Peter at the, Luff, at the Loughborough Carillon. Um, if we think about the last 12 months and COVID, and, we, and again, it was a really interesting conversation at um, two o'clock that we've managed to record with, with Claire from MDEM, the uh, Regional Museum Development Manager, talking about COVID and stuff like that. And obviously, we use this term sort of build back better and stuff, which is which is great, very aspirational. But sometimes where we were weren't brilliant to start with, mm -hmm. and we need to re-examine that. And again, when you look at some museums that we've taken young people to and we've visited ourselves with various projects over the years, you know, um, some of them, some of the biggest barriers they have to young people's involvement and engagement isn't necessarily a lack of technology or you know widgets to push and do like that sometimes it's actually the age of the of the of the volunteers and the people that are involved that kind of see sometimes not so much smaller children because they'll tend to be with like family and carers or grandparents but sort of teenagers as almost like well, they're quite clear they want to be there so we won't really engage them and I think this is what's great about the digital curators project that we've been managed to do and the digital personas this is young people coming up with suggestions of how the museum can engage young people not just everybody but particularly targeting that because young people are going to be taking over and replacing a lot of these older people and volunteers in museums and stuff so really we need to get them interested in it which makes that kind of kick the dust project so interesting i think what's really interesting about the um, example we're about to see with um, Bethany and Mel and Peter out at the Loughborough Carillon um, is the fact that what you've just hit on there is this the need for this creative approach to this intergenerational work within museums and heritage locations. Yet, yeah, my experience over the last year, but then, you know, over the last 10 years. Mm -hmm in various projects and um, activities that we've done, it seems to be normal that a lot of our museum and heritage locations are managed and ran by a particular age group of people. And then there seems to be this real big gap between the younger generation and this older generation. But this, this gap is where the excitement and the magic can happen, like we've seen through digital personas um, and di different projects that we've, we've supported museum and heritage locations to kind of get involved in over the years. And I just feel there needs to be this, this kind of fresh approach to encouraging that younger generation to be excited and intrigued and interested and curious in our museums and heritage locations because they're the ones who will go on to maybe having a career, you know, or going on to working and managing some of these sites. And without us getting that younger generation interested, we, I feel like we could be in quite a bit of trouble in terms of 
people losing interest or it not being on their radar. You know, I know that. Or even considering a career in yeah, heritage and yeah. museums. Is that even something that is even, you know, provided to young people when they're when they're talking about careers? You know, we, we could have that conversation all day long about routes into. Um, but yeah, I think there's a real big need. There's fantastic benefits you'll hear in a second. I mean, when I when I think about the work that Bethany's done to this point with Mel and Peter out at the Carillon and the ideas that she wants to kind of deliver out there as a young person, I think is amazing. The fact that she signed up as a, a volunteer, an official volunteer, yeah. you know, is is absolutely brilliant. And, and this and this is the other thing, isn't it? Before we play that video, is these young people, they're not just on a project with us that's got a time scale. The idea is that the legacy of the project is that all of the young people doing these digital persona projects with the heritage or museum locations have actually signed up with as volunteers with those locations themselves isn't it so it's not about if the project finishes it's the fact that they're, they're committed to being volunteers and yeah. this is something I think Claire touches on as well in, in, in our interview isn't it which is museums need to um, yes recover and reimagine the theme for International Museum Day today but by reimagining it's not about volunteering at a museum and going and being in the space physically it's about reimagining how you can be someone that can be halfway around the world um, or at university or in a different city. But if you're interested in that subject, why can't you be their social media volunteer? You don't physically need to be in the space. So I guess that's part of that kind of reimagine as well, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, definitely. I think that plays a real big role. You know, people get really hell bent on the fact that they need to be in a particular building to physically volunteer. And actually, if we reimagine and look at the various ways that people now are able to interact with organisations, it's easier for me in my lunch break to do some micro actions in terms of retweeting, mm -hmm. reposting, you know, that kind of thing. Something as simple as that has a massive benefit on these smaller museum and heritage locations. Yeah. OK, cool. So let's let's play the um, let's share up the screen and play the interview. Uh, that Lucy, it's Lucy, isn't it? No, yes. Bethany, Bethany uh, done with, uh, has done with, with Peter. Let's get this up on screen here. Hello and welcome everyone to our special International Museums Day newsroom we are joined and i'm really excited that we're joined today by bethany halloway and peter minchell from loughborough carillon um, museum bethany has agreed to interview peter today um, for international museum day and what a fitting theme for this year's event which is recovery and reimagine i'm going to hand over to bethany now who's going to take the lead on the interview. Over to you, Bethna. Hi, so, um, Peter, do you want to, would you be able to tell us a little bit about your role at the museum? Yes, Bethany, I am privileged to be a trustee and an, on the executive committee, so I have a great interest in the future of the Carillon and its role in the community. I'm also a volunteer guide, so I'm able to meet visitors and delight in answering their questions and showing them around our unique museum. Awesome. So what would you say that your um, your favourite part about the role is that you have? I think the favourite is obviously meeting people and um, making certain that they, they gain the, the maximum time and whilst their visit. And that is, if they go away, feeling that they've learned something, then that's what I find really of interest to me. That's what keeps me coming back and doing, like wanting to do more, helping people to appreciate what a unique uh, museum and we have in Loughborough. Yeah, of course. So, um, over the last 18 months, obviously, with the pandemic, how would you say that, um, <laughs> like, how would you say that the, um, 
everything's going towards opening back up, everything, all the plans and everything are going. I think we have to admit that um, it's been a very difficult time. Just before the pandemic, we were in the process of trying to upgrade our museum and we'd applied for lottery funding to try and uh, achieve that aim. We'd uh, taken out all the old cabinets, so we are pretty empty at the moment. And until we get our funding, it means that we can't give the full um, appreciation of the museum. We are trying to um, make certain that part of the museum, and certainly the ground floor, is um, able to be seen by visitors. And we also obviously still have the, the main part, which is the main part, as I'm concerned, is the fact that it is a carillon. And so the visitors can really appreciate what a carillon is. Okay. Um, so, as you know, the theme for this year National Museum Day is recovery and reimagine. How important do you think that it is for the museums in terms of engagement and interaction with your visitors and any new audiences that might come along? I believe young people are by their very nature our, our future audience and it's vital that we adapt and embrace every opportunity to gain with young people and encourage them otherwise it's no good having a museum that is only seen and only appreciated by the older generation. The younger generation are the future and they will have different ideas on how they, they gain that knowledge and information. Whereas uh, older people might be happy to just see objects in a cabinet, younger people want more. They want to be able to see it, particularly on the, the newer platforms and things like that. So that is definitely the future. Okay, so I think this question kind of relates to your answer there. So obviously we have been working with you for um, the Digital Personas project. Um, we look, as you know, we're carrying out some community engagement activities for the Carillon for the museum. How important do you feel it is for the museum's development to have opportunities for the younger people? I think it's tremendously important and um, as I said in my previous point, it, it needs to us to really engage with that. Most of our volunteers don't really understand what uh, all this new technology. I'm lucky that I've been trying to embrace that in my other work. So yes, it's terribly important. Um, so you have, so you guys have very special talents and now you're one of the handful of individuals that can actually play the carillon and um, can you explain for the people that are unsure of what it is actually how it works and what it is that you have to do to play it the carillon to most people they think is a tower and they say well there's some bells up there so they assume uh, that it's very similar to a church and the church will have bells but the fact that the church and the carillon both have bells is just about the only thing that they do have. We have in that tower that you can see in the background there, at the top of that tower, there are 47 bells ranging in weight from four and a half tons right down to very small bells. And with that, it means that we can play any melody, any piece of music that you can play on a piano or, or an accordion we can assimilate that on a carillon. And the way it is played is, I suppose, similar to a, an organ and such like, but instead of keys, you have wooden batons, which I have to strike with my fists. So those wooden batons, and every one of those wooden batons is connected to a bell in the bell tower. So with that ability, you can play wonderful music. But of course, it's, <laughs> It's a very big instrument. In fact, a carillon is the biggest instrument in the world. It also means that if you're playing it, everybody hears every mistake, because if I play a wrong note, everybody in the park would know. So <laughs> you have to be careful what you do with it. It's very, it's the 97-year-old 97 instrument. And so it has to be treated with great respect. And 
the reason I started playing it was because I realized that a lot of people were coming and the, the only time they could actually listen to it was when our borough Carolina, Caroline Sharp, was able to play it. And that only happened twice a week. She was uh, contracted to play on a Thursday for an hour and a Sunday for an hour. And even during the times that, um, when we were, that was the times when we were open, the rest of the year, she only was able to play once a month. So I had visitors coming in when she wasn't playing, and they were very disappointed that some of them had come all the way from Australia specifically to hear the Caroline. So they really were disappointed that they, they couldn't hear it. So I thought, well, I ought to try and do something about this, which is why I put myself on a pedestal. And I was lucky enough to um, get the agreement of the Borough Council. And as you probably know, I'm one of only three people that are privileged enough to be able to allowed to play it. So that is what I'm doing and that is what I will do once we get back into the tower and uh, hopefully have visitors back. I think that is incredible, yeah. And for anyone that wants to see Peter playing, um, we have some videos on the Karen on social media accounts, so everyone's welcome to head over to those and check it out. And then um, finally, how can people hear the Carolina and find out about any upcoming performances, if there are any planned or? In the museum, the Carol, uh, the uh, Charmwood Museum, they do sell our DVD, which I'm, I made with Caroline. I produced this because, again, I thought there is a, there's a gap in the market. So this DVD uh, is a musical melody and this has proved to be quite popular. So that's one opportunity. And of course, we have examples on our website as well. I think that you can find that. And of course, come into the park and listen. Yeah, of I think that's all the questions now from me. So thank you for the great answers. Thank you. That's great. I enjoyed listening to that. He's a real character, wasn't he? Oh, he's, he's absolutely brilliant. A bit of product placement there. And you could really, really uh, just, you can just pick up from him his passion and his, his just attitude to actually wanting to get things done and promote um, the museum. Um, so, yeah, he's absolutely, is a pleasure to have met and kind of currently working with. And I know Bethany is absolutely enjoying working with the guys there. What didn't come across in that interview actually was just before we did that interview, we had um, a visit out there with Bethany. So she actually got to see the museum. She's been researching and reading its history and links to um, various local, um, local activities and stuff. Um, and when she actually got to meet Peter for the first time and Mel. Um, Peter's really, really into photographer. The image in the background is one of his own photographs. Um, and Bethany re is really into photography as well. So very quickly, with probably almost not even 10 minutes into the visit, Peter was very, um, you know, motivated and passionate about taking Beth Nett at all what I would call the sweet spots in the park where she could get the best images of the um, of the tower and it's all explorer and then he actually took her all the way to the top so she could get some great images um, looking out across um, Loughborough which she absolutely loved and um, they're going to be running a community photographic competition for the public to engage in over the summer um, as part of a bit of an activity offering for the museum. So it's really exciting. But again, that intergenerational thing, you know, there is the willingness, there is the kind of the wanting. I think sometimes it's just not hand-holding, but actually working with an organisation that has got a good track record of working with young people and kind of them almost helping these venues seems to be more of a better approach than actually trying to match 
young people and, and them getting on with it. Yeah, I guess it's also the fact that the young person's involved in the project. Bethany's getting involved because she's interested in photography and using social media. And she's taken on an Instagram account. Where obviously, some of these photos that she's been taking and stuff have been going on, as she mentions there in the, in the interview about that, doesn't she? So that, that's the catalyst. It's not about, are you interested in music? Are you interested in that kind of music? Bells, classical music? You know, do you know what a carillon is? It's actually the photography's the catalyst. Yeah. Uh, and then from that comes, and, that, and that's the other thing, I guess, about the whole reimagine, isn't it, for, for museums coming back now. The, as a, volunteers in a museum, it's not about knowing everything or necessarily being interested in what the subject matter is of the museum. Museums are public spaces. And Claire was very keen on saying that to us, wasn't she? That, you know, museums tend to think that they're special spaces. Yes, they are. The collection they have is special but there's still a public space that has a cafe, health and safety, volunteers, you know, public toilets, those kind of things. I think that's one of the things to, to bear in mind that just because you don't know about the subject matter, it doesn't mean that a museum doesn't want you as a volunteer because it's, it's the different kind of skills, skills that you bring, isn't it? I would say hand on art from, you know, previous experience, but in particular the last 14 months, I would say if, young people have an awful lot of experience and um, talent that could bring lots and lots of benefits mm. to museum and heritage locations. Of all kinds without of Without them even realising that that's what they would do. Mm. Just, just by the very nature of how they spend the majority of their day interacting, promoting themselves, marketing themselves, you know, because that's what young people do across their own social media platforms every day. You know, if you could just harness a fraction of that and divert that through a creative opportunity in a museum or heritage location, I think you'd be halfway there. Cool. And just before we move on to, to the next uh, interview with Tom at Moira Furness that was done by Lucy, let's talk a little bit about these young people because you're working with quite a large cohort. There's about nine of them, isn't yeah. there? And a large number of those have come through Leicester College yeah. um, because they were unable to get work placement opportunities due to lockdown. So it's been great that Leicester College have been and kind of responded to that um, sort of call out for young people to, to get involved. So again, these young people aren't the usual suspects when it comes to those that would engage in museums or, or that kind of stuff. Well, I think, yeah, uh, the last 12 months, 14 months for any young person, has been a little bit of a kind of, you know, they've been in turmoil in terms of the courses they're on, accessing opportunities, and that's where this really came about. There, because of, you know, where we found ourselves in the last 14 months, there are companies that used to provide work experience and placements for young people um, that were in abundance, and those opportunities have not been around. So fortunate there because of our networks and the way kind of we've been able to work with the Y Heritage team and Haley and the Youth Accelerator Fund, which obviously provided additional funding for them to create opportunities for more young people, which then enabled us to work with Natalie from Leicester College. Um, and a lot of students there have taken up placements, which they otherwise wouldn't have been able to do. And to some people, that might not be a big thing because everybody's had to go through it. But when you're actually talking to young people that are thinking, I'm on a three year course, I've got to do a placement in year two. And I don't get to do it in year two, which means now I've got to do it in year three on top of all my fun, the pressures, the impact on their mental health and well-being, the worry of them not being able to manage their workload. This project and these opportunities have just actually happened to come at the right time and those young people have been in the right place at the right time to be able to take them up um, and not all the young people have come from Leicester mm. College on those placements we do have a couple of young people from Focus the charity based on Churchgate um, who do a great job of working with some fantastic young people um, on a various number of projects. So we've got a couple of young people from Focus who are working out at Melton Museum. 
um, with their digital personas out there and doing something quite special with their red door. So yeah, um, we, we have been able to provide a real robust group of young people, some real great opportunities that as I touched on before, have been able to take those opportunities because of the different courses they're on and actually weave their own interest areas into them so they are i would say really really meaningful opportunities and i suppose the the legacy the the kind of telling point for me will be at the end of the Y heritage project just how many of those young people continue to stay engaged with those museums because of the experience and the way in which management and volunteers have kind of welcomed them and kind of yeah. develop those relationships so for me that's that's what I'm looking forward to yeah I think one of the things that's quite key as well is we've not kind of thrust it or try to put it in a box and push it down the, down the road of employability all the time like you know life skills and you know the life skills are actually more important isn't it in this project than actually employability and getting a job in the museum or careers or go to university that's kind of in the background and the information is there to share with the young people if they're interested but it's more about the confidence that comes and the fact that you know in a in a work environment which for some people you know work some of the people they're working with they're full-time employees of the, of the museum uh, while working in that work environment that as a volunteer and as a young person you've actually got something where you're more knowledgeable than they are even if they use that platform themselves in their own life you've actually got something they can use in their work environment and I think that's really important it comes with a lot of uh, belief in your own uh, and having confidence in yourself then isn't it what has been fundamental for me in turn and really insightful really is I have one-to-one -one calls with each of the digital persona young people every week um, and their commitment is two and a half hours a week to the project so we'll have a meet up we'll talk about what we're working on what little tasks they'll go away and we'll come back and um, do that for me it's how these young people are, are being self-motivated, um, a great at looking at a museum, looking at what the current offer is, and actually just working out the creative bit of being able to join the dots in the spaces where there needs to be something. So, you know, young people who are looking at the educational offer of a museum and actually going, okay, you've got this activity, wouldn't it be great if we revamped it to become digital or, you know, could we replicate that so it looks like this? And all the time, I think the generation of their ideas and concepts are just blowing these museums away. And it's almost like, it's not, it's not, I suppose it's not to say the people, the managers and, you know, who are running museums have not wanted to, it's almost like, who knew it could be so creative? <laughs> Did your transformation, was, it could be fun. Who knew there was so much to gain from, you know, having young people involved. And I just would say they are like a breath of fresh air, you know, to just see them running <laughs> with ideas and having, just having conversations about artifacts and objects and, history, all the stuff that if we paid all our attention to the mainstream media, we're told that young people are not interested in. So it's almost like you're, you're in there and it's almost like this shouldn't be working because everybody says that young people don't get on with older people or, yeah. you know. Or are not interested in going yeah, to museums yeah. and stuff like that. So. But that is yeah. definitely not um, what I've experienced through this project. Well, that, that was a great interview that um, Bethany did there with um, Peter. And obviously Bethany's really come in and picked that whole, um, that whole opportunity up and has really enjoyed it, I think, as well made a really big difference as well. Tell us a little bit about her engagements with Mel around... Um, Instagram and stuff. Like so that. Mel, um, who is <laughs> so you've got Peter. Another character. Yeah, and a laugh for a definitely. You've got you've got Peter, who we've just um, heard from there, who takes the lead on the actual Carolyn, and then you've got Mel, who um, Mel Gold, who is kind of the war memorial expert, if you like, 
Um, is and, that is that around the tower, around the bottom of the yeah. tower? Yeah. So it kind of like, yeah, the first two levels of the museum are kind of dedicated to Loughborough's history and. I'm not going to say too much about that in case I say something that's not right and Mel will tell me off when, you, yeah. when we have my next yeah. meeting with him. Yeah. But you, can't, you can't get anything wrong with Mel. <laughs> Mel is great. He's the, kind, he's the chair, he's the kind of person who, you know, gets the website updated, you know, communicates with people. And one of his big things up until this point is he's took a lead on the social media. And what really frustrates him um, that I see in his content from his emails is the fact that he can put a lot of time and effort into something, a post that he'll put out on Instagram that he'll get no engagement with, but yet he's looking on other people's Instagram and people are getting thousands of likes for a plate of food. And in his mind, he cannot get his head around that. So his request was to ask Bethany, what am I doing wrong? How can I engage people better? Because on average, I'm getting X amount of interactions through each post that I go out. And it is just beautiful to see these email exchanges um, between him and Bethany um, around social media. And Bethany's response was, Mel, maybe you need to try the following. If you ask people questions, they're more likely to interact. Well, that was it. <laughs> Every post Bethany put, with her little wand was like, yeah. ask some questions, Mel. Bing. So every post he puts out now has some kind of call to action or a question. And it is meant that the actual interaction with or um, from people and his social media have gone off the chart. So he is loving the fact that, you know, you've got this young expert, if you like, because let's face it, you know, young people are experts in social media. You know, they they've been brought up with it you know it's part and parcel of their life me and you we've had to allow social media into our lives yep. but young people have grown up with it therefore they are the experts by the very nature and i think also that it doesn't it's not about being qualified no. it's not about where you're going to school what your education is what your exams are even your life experience is the fact that you know at the end of the day bethany knew exactly what to do in order to get more engagement for mel and obviously he was absolutely delighted yeah Cool. Right, so let's watch the next um, film that we've got. Um, this is uh, Lucy, who was interviewing Tom at um, Moira Furnace. So let's uh, let's share this share this screen. Hello and welcome to our very special International Museums Day newsroom. Today, we are joined by Lucy Davenport, who is part of our Digital Persona project. And we are really, really excited to welcome Tom Phillips from Moira Furnace today. Nice to, nice to see you both. And you, and you. Yes, good to be here, thank you. Brilliant. Now, I'm, I'm going to step back because Lucy has agreed to interview Tom for us today. Um, so I'm going to hand over Lucy. Thank you very much. So just a couple of questions, but to start off, what actually is your role at Moira Furnace and what does it kind of involve? Uh, my role is site manager and it involves pretty much everything. Uh, you name it, I, I've done it. I mean, it's, I, I'm in charge of the whole site, um, in charge of all the events we put on, uh, ultimate ultimately responsible for the volunteers, uh, managing the volunteers, uh, responsible for the income generation, dealing with grants um, and that kind of stuff, dealing with outside agencies, third parties. And yeah, you name it, I, I do it. Um, I have just recently got an assistant um, and they'll be starting next Saturday. It's very exciting. And their yeah. main role will be to um, from the museum, the boat, and the park when we're open, and to manage the volunteers uh, on a day to day basis. So, this is some of the load on me, which means I can then look at the rest of, of that job, which would be uh, yeah. a load off. But yeah, that's what I do, everything really. Yeah, so you, so you do quite a lot, but what would you say your favourite part about your job actually is? My favourite part about the job is driving up the drive 
in the morning along the edge of the ancient woodland with the furnace in front of me. If I ever get stressed in the office with too much paperwork, I can go for a site walk where I just down tools and walk around the place to take a site just to relax and breathe. And that way it helps me uh, keep just what's going on around the site. There might be might have been some vandalism, uh, there might be some litter, there might be some broken through wear and tear. And, you know, we have those to our jobs list and point the volunteers in the right way. I just love working in such a lovely place and mm -hmm. the joint top of the volunteers sheer energy and enthusiasm considering the majority of our volunteers are retired which most volunteers are because they're the ones that have the time you know they're, they're mm -hmm. still full of life and they give me a real run for my money and i absolutely love it love being kept on your toes by them oh yes oh, <laughs> yes yes yeah, great so um i can imagine that the volunteers has had an impact over the past 18 months but in general, what has been impacted by COVID over the past 18 months? What hasn't been impacted by COVID, really? True. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's been a real shift in what we've been able to do and how we've been able to work. Mm -hmm. uh, we rely, or have relied, we, we still do get, um, we have a service level agreement with the district council. Process the district council, and as part of that, we get the grant £37,500. It's sat there, it's public knowledge, um, because they own where are we? they own the uh, furnace building there, they own mm -hmm. some of the land, um, and it's leased out to us, and we manage it and work with the museum. Um, so, because we've got that, had that grant. We weren't able to get business grants, you know, recovery grants. Um, I wasn't able to be furloughed, nor my former assistant. So the trust have had to keep paying me. So I've had to keep working. I've worked from home. Luckily, uh, Museum of Brothers East Midlands um, Small Grant Fund had not long before this kicked off had supplied money to buy laptops. So I can take a laptop home, my assistant can take a laptop home to work home. Volunteers, I, we took the decision to, to stay at home until it's safe to come back. And so it's been very bitty problem with volunteers. Yeah. Um, during the first lockdown, I was out on the ride on mower, doing all the lawn mowing, going around emptying the bins. So my role was very much a hands on role. So, you know, I was yeah. doing what I did do. I loved it, I, yeah. yeah. There's only uh, so many walks with the kids around your house and the area around there you can tolerate before going back. So this was a nice break. But then coming out of lockdown in the summer, it was, I, I know a lot of museums, they delayed and put off opening a bit to they were really confident they were safe to open. Um, but I managed to get this up and running by the start of August. Before that, we had a month and a half worth of trading where we managed to set up a takeaway tea and coffee service, yeah. um, which brought us some income. It was great. It's the on site cafe, the cafe that they decided to not open until uh, July. So uh, we, we were making money. And by the end of the year, uh, we'd actually made some money which was just amazing. Yeah. Looking at all the rest of the, the museum and heritage checks, a lot of people reported losses. But I think the fact that we are a small organisation really mm. helped us. We didn't have to worry about multiple sites, we didn't have to worry about multiple employees. It was just me and my assistant. And then come August, my, my assistant uh, moved on to a, another, another job, so just me then. Um, so we only had to worry about paying myself and the volunteers were itching to get back so as soon as they were allowed to get back you know, Imagine. Back, it's worth their weight in gold because it's free you yes. know it, it's brilliant and it meant that we could actually make some money going forward to this year mm -hmm. we managed to open up on the 29th of march we opened up running the Joseph Wilt, which is the boat you can see behind me. 
because uh, again, as you can see, the seating is open air. You can't get more COVID friendly than that. It's very well ventilated. And uh, as well, if I, uh, where I'm pointed there, that window there, we opened yeah. up, but uh, some decking out the front. And um, we use that as a takeaway hatch to sell teas and coffees, various refreshments. And it's nice. just gone. Yeah, it's gone crazy. The cafe has only just opened up today. Um, mm -hmm. And in the interim, we have made thousands of pounds just for, for the visitors visit the site because they're desperate to get out and about. Yeah. Not their, not their local walk that they've been doing every day for God knows how long. They, they, they just want to get out and about. And so we are nice and safe. We're open air. Um, and we're very excited to open the museum this coming Saturday on the 22nd of May. And now it's been lifted. We've got some reenactors. 1815 era, the Wars, we've got an on site burger van, uh, as well as a cafe and art refreshments. Now, it's things are slowly starting to, to feel a bit more normal. Yeah. Um, so, the impact has not been as bad as we thought, but I think it's all down to quick thinking, thinking outside the box, and, and adapting. I think yeah. that's the question. Yes, yes, it has. <laughs> it has. Um, so today is actually International Museums Day and the theme is recovery and reimagine. How important is this to you, uh, is to it to museums, sorry, when it comes to engaging and interacting with audiences? The recovery bit, well I've just covered that, you know, yeah. you have to bounce back. Um, I know there's now a shift in the museum and heritage sector. Uh, to thinking more of running museums and heritage sites as a business to ensure they're making money, not relying on the grants, because there's been a lot of grants that have been given out. And the worry is you know, that money's going to come from somewhere and it could dry up. Very easily dry up, though. They could say, well, you had all these thousands, hundreds of thousands of pounds during the pandemic. We've got nothing now. So, you know, I have always run this side like a business. We are a charity trust, but at the end of the day, if you're not making money, you can't then reinvest it in the site to do jobs you want. You have to rely on those grants, you can't get the grants in. So, uh, uh, for the reimagining part, um, it's really important. It's something I try and get across to the volunteers that we need to change what's in our museum on a regular basis to attract people to come and look around or come back and return. It's not expensive to go around our museum. It's two pounds fifty. It's not a lot, and you can go around within an hour. But yeah. it's one of those you go around, oh, it's nice, one and done, go home. That, that's it. But as a museum, you want people to come back again and again and again, at least once a year. And so I've tried to rotate and change things. So this year we've we've changed where the canal. Uh, information to put that up in the bridge loft so it's next to the iron work and then that whole story of the industrial age and place all together so the layout of there is slightly different so you come from the interpretation board as well it's a few new in, important facts that we found out since the original display was done um, and then downstairs we've got um, a project all about the furnace families and people who live in this fantastic building um, years ago you know the coal miners and now we're doing a project on the people who lived on the site out the front called Crescent and which are in history from the 1920s all the way up to the 1980s um, we're trying to track down the families and the people who lived there get their stories we've got loads of pictures of the place the local area we want their stories why did they move there why were the houses built who lived where we already know the numbering system of the houses changed halfway through its life. It went one to 40 odd one way and then it changed and went one to 40 the other way. So we get people going, I lived at number 32. Well, which number 32, you know? Mm. Just trying to make sense of what happened. And that connects with the local community. And that's a project that will grow and develop over the next few years. We get more and more people in and we interview them and get their story. We can change. Stories up there. So we're reimagining 
our museum on a constant basis to make it more exciting and interesting for the people who are coming in. And also looking at ways to interact with uh, children and young people. And, um, we are hoping to get a big grant to completely redo the bridge off. And so we can have a more interactive experience up there for the um, industry, industrial heritage exhibit. Uh, but that's that's a long term thing. We can look at next year for that. But again, that reimagining, uh, not just plodding on doing the same old thing because people won't come back or come back once. You don't want to make £2.50 out of them once and that's it. They want to come back yeah. the next year and see what's different and the next year. And then they come back and they spread the word. Oh, it's, you know, it's good there, they keep changing, and then their friends come, and then you all spread it your story to, to more people. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So, sort of linked to the reimagining side, um, what are you looking forward to most over the next 12 months in the museum? Uh, looking forward to it opening this Saturday yes. um, and seeing oh, people. Awesome. Yeah, yeah, seeing people actually back in the museum. So it's really been great to see the amount of people on site in um, <laughs> Looking forward to events. We've got craft fairs coming up, we've got motor clubs, we've got outdoor theatre, um, all this uh, stuff happening. But to get people in the museum so they can find out, discover the story behind this wonderful place where they come to watch bits of an ice cream, or they come to look at the cars that are here. So if they come back at the weekends and we're open and they look around the museum, then you know, they really get a sense and a feel of what this place was and how important it was and how important it is in the whole of Europe. It's the best preserved furnace of its kind in Europe. And I'm really excited to spread that word. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So just to round it all together, how can people actually keep up to date with what's going on at the museum? So we have a website, uh, moirafurnace.org. Um, so all the information's on there. Uh, also the best place really is the Facebook page. Um, I've really managed to grow that over the past few years. Everything's on there. We have got an Instagram account, but that and that really gets updated. Uh, gets updated more than the Twitter, but again, we're on Twitter. You just look for Moira Furnace. We're on all three platforms. Started making some short videos as well. And if you search for Moira Furnace on YouTube, you'll find us up there. And you can find out a bit more about the site as a whole. Um, I know there's a few more exciting things coming up in terms of social media that uh, certain somebody might be involved in. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so check out us on Facebook, really, and our, on our website, get all the information. And if you need any information, messages on Facebook, email office at moderateface.org, or, or find the phone number on the website, that's cool. Awesome. Well, thank you for your time, and thank you for answering all my questions. And thank you for having me. Great. What a great interview, isn't it? It's really interesting. I did like the bit where Tom said about um, he regularly he was he changes the canal and he, he said the canal like uh, information on that. I thought, well, if Tom wanted to change the canal, I think he probably could. <laughs> like, he's, he just, I've just moved the canal around that side of the building this time, just make it easier for people when they turn up. That's really interesting. Also fascinating that they still use the Facebook more than other platforms, social media platforms, as well as the website. And this is this is what we're finding more and more now you know even in the teaching that we do and talking to people all around the world you know maybe younger people like Bethany and Lucy their fantastic interview might be moving away from Facebook as a platform as they move into other innovative and maybe more interesting ones now organizations particularly voluntary sector organizations and charitable trusts are still using Facebook as a way of engaging people Lucy Lucy did a really good interview there too. She did, and um, again, I think when you actually listen to Tom and how passionate he is about the role that he does, you know, I know that, you know, he's, he's actually got a teaching background and an outdoor suits background, which when you actually take the time to understand and look at the museum and the area that kind of the museum, the country park it sits in, 
you know, how Tom is able to bring all these things to play, you know, his, his teaching background, you know, brings with it that understanding of what young people want and how they kind of creatively engage. His outdoor pursuits background, you know, lends itself to his ability to get really, really um, involved in that kind of community, local history and actually bring the country park and the outside into the museum in a really creative way. So I'm out of all of the venues, it is up there with one of my favorites that are part of the project, just in terms of the fact that um, Tom is a bit of a anomaly in himself. I think he brings the age demographic of museum management. Plummeting. Yeah. He plummets the age museum of someone running running it. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I just I just feel that um, when we first approach um, more referred to as a museum um, for the Digital Personas project, um, and we're working with Wendy and Sean from Pudding Bag Productions um, as part of the Digital Persona project out at Maura Furnace as well. But Tom's response and engagement with the project um, from the first point that we had contact with him has always been very enthusiastic. You know, he's been highly motivated to kind of work with Lucia um, and Neve. Um, to get them involved in kind of um, shaping the digital persona project and what that looks like at um, Moira Furness. And like he, he is on in, in the interview, just like Peter did in the previous interview, we've got these, um, you know, these things we should be shouting about. Like he said, that's the best preserved furnace in Europe. Yeah. You know, the Carillon in... Um, <coughs> in Lovra is, you know, is again one of a limited number of actual instruments that are still played today and they've been uniquely preserved and I think it's these things, these messages that social media and young people can creatively help to, to get out there and, and promote because they're little gems and who, who would know? Who, I wouldn't have ever found out that Moira Furnace was one of the best preserved furnaces in Europe, mm. unless I'd taken the time to visit, have a conversation. Mm. So, you know, there is a big job for us to be able to help get those messages out there in a creative way and entice people to kind of be curious and inquisitive into what the museum looks like this season or what new objects, what new facts. And it's, it's really great. Tom kind of pointed on it, uh, kind of hit on it a little bit when he spoke there, but yeah, museums and heritage locations have not been able to open to the public. That doesn't mean that they've not been, you know, kind of developing their offer. And like you said, finding out new facts, things that people are interested in. And I think with a lot of these museum and heritage locations, that community hook, that kind of, yeah, it's great to have visitors who come into your area to visit your visitor attraction, but be under no illusion, your local community, your bread and butter, you know, they're there. And the more creatively you change and put on different, a different offer, the more times they are going to come back. And I think whilst sometimes museums get hell bent on you know, new audiences, that should not deter them from, you know, the importance of the interaction and they wear, the way they constantly take their local community on that journey with them, you know, and I think a lot more museums have that local history kind of connection to them. So I really like the fact that, that um, Tom kind of shared like the people that used to live in the Crescent and it's got people talking about, oh, well, my grandpa, my, you know, my great aunt used to live in those. And without people taking the time to focus and capture that, very easily those stories can be lost because you leave it a little bit more and those people are not around anymore to actually capture that local. So there is that kind of importance on um, making sure that not only 
does your museum do its museum thing but actually it is it has got that really embedded connection to the community in the area that's interesting so. isn't it because you tend to go into a museum to get the history and what's happened whereas in fact sometimes it's the fact that the museum's been there that long may be unchanged to an yeah. extent because of the development that's gone on around it as you imagine Leicester's New Walk Museum, for example, um, or Leicester Museum and Art Gallery, as it's called now, you know, what that has seen mm -hmm. since that, that, that opened, not only the developments inside it and the changes in the collection, but also how New Walk has changed, how the, the development of the city around it, you know, the, the city council towers being demolished, being blown up and stuff, you know, what the building has seen. And I guess that's really where something like a digital persona really comes in, isn't it? Where it's a, a person, a place, or an event you turn into a digital persona, it allows it to tell a story in a different way that is maybe slightly more engaging than it being a sort of cold delivery on social media of almost chronological facts and figures. It's a bit, a bit more interesting. So as Tom mentioned there, up in his um, loft area where the Iron um, Works exhibition is, there is a, um, a life-size statue of a horse and a man which Lucy has creatively been working on to kind of bring to life through its own Instagram platform. So she's at the stage now where she is going to be working with Tom and his team to creatively create the content that will go out over the new social media platform. Um, I think it's called Die and Coal. So they, she did a bit of a Instagram poll and kind of spoke to the public about some names. Um, and I think she's in the process now of working to put together some nice engaging competitions and posts so that when people come and visit the museum, they can have a selfie with dying coal and upload it and kind of add a hashtag to be able to engage in competitions and things. But that, that's her kind of thing she's pushing forward um, at Maury Furnace. So, one more thing before we move on about Maury Furnace, which we've got a we've got a kind of another nod to the success of um, the actual museum is because it is in that lovely um, country park just near the Ashby Canal. Um, the fact that Tom said that they've opened up a hatch and had it selling coffees and cakes because obviously, even though the museum was shut, being able to run the boats and people actually coming for countryside walks and stuff has meant that he's had a bit of a, a blind in Easter bank holiday, which has kind of set the bar really. So um, no pressure on um, the guys out at Moor Furnace to have a smashing year. And some of those events and stuff that he spoke about, I think I might um, have a yep. look on the website myself and uh, go and visit a few of those. Sounds like there's going to be lots of lots happening out there. Yeah, um, some good takeaways from both of those interviews. I think one is uh, Bethany engaging with um, Mel about using his social media to get more engagement uh, on Instagram by asking questions. And clearly, you know, Lucy as well by using Instagram to start asking, you know, having, having a poll about what people want to call things. I think we need to uh, encourage museums now to stop doing things for people and asking people what they'd like the, the museum and heritage location to do. Um, and, and also really, you know, Peter being quite innovative or sort of creating his own CD, DVD for a CD for, for, for sale, being a bit entrepreneurial. And then you've got Tom with his super hatch, you know, making teas and yeah. coffees and, and, and servicing a need. So I think, you know, it's not just about recover and reimagine. It's about, you know, it's innovation and, you know, look, look within as well, because sometimes you've got the own, your own answers to some of the challenges that you have and the people that you're around you. So that's brilliant. I thought that was Great, two, two great interviews that we've managed to capture there as well. Um, we'll be posting the links to both of them again um, on our YouTube channel. So feel free to use them and share them and use them as a conversation starter, maybe for your, for your own group or your own venue and, and get in touch with us. We're happy to facilitate that for you. So as we move into the second hour, it's um, coming up for 10 past two. Um, we've got a, uh, an interview now with Claire Brown, who's the Regional Museum Development Manager at MDEM, um, which is Museum Development East Midlands. And the great thing about this conversation, uh, which we did last week, last, last Friday, I think it was, is 
we've, we've spoken about young people there and volunteers and the role of, um, of your museum staff and, and venues and innovative venues like Maury Furness and, and uh, Loughborough Camelon. But this is an opportunity really to get a little bit of information behind the scenes from a regional perspective about some of the challenges that have been going on throughout mm. lockdown. And the support, um, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. And, and sort of having to reimagine some. And I, and I felt Claire was very honest with us when we asked her some questions about um, the challenges on the organisation itself before it even starts supporting museums. So um, I'm quite keen to, to share this with everybody. And um, it's um, slightly longer than the others. This one's a, a 28 minute uh, conversation, but um, normally we play clips of them, but we just felt it was so important what was said that we'll, we'll play it in its entirety because I think the conversation we have afterwards, um, you, you people will see why, why it correlates. So let's, let's go to the uh, share screen. As part of our International Museum Day newsroom, we thought it would be really important to catch up with someone who's incredibly important locally uh, and regionally talking about what they do. And um, it's been wonderful over the last, uh, particularly over lockdown, to talk to, to Claire. So I'm, de I'm delighted that uh, Claire Brown, the uh, Regional Museum Development Manager from Museum Development East Midlands, has taken the time to join us. So thanks very much, Claire, for coming along for a chat. That's all right. Very pleased to be here. Good. So um, let's let's start uh, before we get into what MDEM is. Is how are you? Have you managed to survive um, to survive everything with lockdown? You, you know, we're a couple of days away now from museums being able to open again. Is it a busy time? Yeah, it's it's a really busy time. There's been um, a lot of questions and queries about the reality of opening, the the practicalities as much as anything. You know managing visitors coming back what does everybody expect will they come back you know all of that but yeah for a lot of places um it's it's been excitement really because they've been closed for a long time um they've had a lot of issues those that need to earn money through opening have been chomping at the bit to get back open and those that are volunteer led have had a lot of issues around whether volunteers will come back you know so they've they've been asking themselves questions about whether they can reopen in the same way that they did um so it's yeah it's been it's been a, a busy time but it's it's great to see things changing for the positive now that's that's a great thing to see yeah, net, 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 um having, having spoken to you quite a few times over the last sort of you know 12 12 months talking about you know the digital personas projects and all these kind of things that we've done with Leicester's White Heritage Project which have been fantastic it always seems to me that when someone's in your position it's about you're managing an organization you've got you know you've got the various forums and that that you support and you know there's the Heritage Awards recently which was fantastic to see and you're encouraging people to participate in training and you know come along to like you know events and get involved and you help people with all their kind of day-to-day you know, -day structures and templates and stuff and something like covid comes along which is completely out of the blue completely out of the norm i mean actually there is there is actually no way i mean we even, we even said before we came on didn't we you said may is normally quite quiet but it seems busier it's because i think yeah. every every deadline and anniversary we have now it will be in different times, it was like this, but now in this kind of post-COVID or COVID coping world, it's very different. Do you feel that for the first time that you're using MDEM in a way that's actually quite good and interesting? It must be quite exciting at the same time, and I don't mean that in a, in a kind of a horrible way. Yeah. Obviously, it's been a real challenging time and people have died, and that's very, very serious. But suddenly, you're, you're actually needed even more yeah than before yeah. so i mean that must be quite a challenge for you to be able to rise to that and then also with your staff as well with your staff too. yeah it is you know i think i think that that is the right word actually even though there's been a lot of negatives and uh, so on attached to covid but actually um what we found was as soon as uh, lockdown kicked in in march last year uh we just we just had to completely rethink we had to say okay throw out the business plan for next year all the stuff we were going to do and what it what is it that we need to do to react to support museums because 
that's our role you know we're there to support primarily accredited museums but we will you know support all museums as far as we can um in different ways and to respond to their different needs and of course what we were suddenly struck by was that the sector needed to, to flex, you know, that we didn't, we couldn't predict what they needed. So we started to rethink the fact that we have grants every year, we run small grants, um, and we wanted to repurpose those. So a lot of our, our programme funding uh, went into grants that museums could suddenly apply for to think differently about what they were doing, because the initial couple of months were a bit of shock, you know, a bit of like, right, we're closed, um, we've got staff issues, some we, we can't afford to keep staff on in the sense, you know, we have to put them on furlough. Um, all of that was new, all of managing that was new. People with volunteers were saying, how do we keep in contact with volunteers? How do we maintain that relationship so they're still interested? And then as it progressed, it became very apparent that it was going to go on longer than we all thought. So that started to impact on how we were supporting museums because they needed to think about connecting with audiences while they were in this long period of closure so it was about digital working in a more remote way with people but also with volunteers you know they they had to think how do we keep people engaged um a lot of people were shielding um volunteers couldn't necessarily come on site because obviously with social distancing so a lot of our support went into helping museums to get a bit of money to set up new ways of working. So that might have been a new digital offer, um, improving their websites, starting to do things like online talks, um, just reimagining reinterpretation of collections online, you know, just things that they could do that would connect with audiences, but would be a different approach. And that might have just needed a bit of investment. But then alongside that, we were running training online around things like engaging with schools, because that's a big area for museums and it can be an income area as well. So it was like, God, how do we suddenly keep this relationship with schools when they're closing and opening and all over the place as well? It was um, it was important for us to, to maintain that that kind of relevant training and not just stick to a plan that we'd always had. But the other thing that I think was vitally important was networking. So for our sector, um, people do network quite well anyway. We have county forums, as you know, in Leicestershire, we have a, a really good um, Museums and Heritage Forum. Um, but it, we needed more than that. We needed some specialist networks. So we set up um, a regional leaders network online, which was actually a bit of a, a moment for people in a leadership role just to offload just to say to each other, aren't you having, you know, are you having the same issues? We've got, you know, most of our team on furlough, but we've got all this fundraising to do just to keep the, the organisation afloat. Um, people were going for emergency funding that the government was offering. So they wanted to kind of talk to each other about what that meant, who was eligible, interpreting the criteria, all of that stuff. Um, and then some of the other things that came out of COVID were around the fact that, people weren't able to get to their sites, you know, so they weren't monitoring the buildings, they weren't doing that regular maintenance, they weren't monitoring their collections and the environments those collections were in. And so we've actually come out with things like pest infestations, because it was like a perfect storm for pests, you know, let's be neglected, let's, you know, have dark spaces in stores with lovely museum objects and ephemera to eat. and um, the mild weather as well so so we've responded to that by setting up a pest network where people can share knowledge about how to tackle pests and we've got um our own expertise to feed into that so yeah it's it was literally throw out the plan and start to to be responsive and flexible that's really what what we did i think that's lovely how you've encapsulated it there because <laughs> literally it was like trying to make a plan on quicksand <laughs> there were no fixed points. I mean, yeah, you know, having put up tents, tents in, in windy and rainy weather before, I realised you're only going to be successful when the first peg gets in, and then it's going to be solid. And we've yeah. got an entire sector. And I think you said at the, be in the beginning of your talk there about it being, you know, we had to flex. We had to be kind of adaptable and think in new ways. And you know, 
the old days of sitting around for a staff team meeting now, as I'm sure it used to do with, okay, let's think about next year's plan. You know, anybody got any ideas about trends and spot what's coming down the road? And well, of course, this is something that's tested everybody everywhere in so many different yeah. ways that affected everybody. So uh, it's one of those things I think, you know, to be able to even still be here, you should be proud of. <laughs> As an observer, <laughs> I think we're doing really well to still be here and be positive. But also, I mean, you, you've released yesterday um, yeah. your volunteering needs report for 2021. I mean, has that been very much informed by the impact of COVID over the last sort of, you know, 12 months and how re- how important volunteers are really to be able to return? Because I think when people come to venues, they expect a coffee shop or, you know, a little gift shop. They expect it to work and for it to be open without any real understanding that probably most of the people that they'll see and engage with won't be paid. They'll all be volunteers right. in some kind of capacity. It's really important with this sector in particular, the role of volunteers. Yeah, I think you're you're absolutely right. Um, it was hugely info, informed by COVID, the report, um, and it was really because we were hearing directly from organisations about their worries over um, their volunteering workforce and how important it is to their um, capacity. And really, you know, what we did was we we threw out a survey to museums just to get an idea of the impact on volunteering through um, COVID. And we were astonished, you know, by the response. We, we In two weeks, we had 80 museums across the region reply of all shapes and sizes, you know, some with paid staff, um, a lot that were just totally volunteer run. And what shocked us the most was the statistic that 22% of volunteers are thought to have been lost during COVID. So that that is a, a massive impact, as you can imagine, because you're absolutely right, John, you know, what people forget is that, you know, the National Trust has paid staff, you know, managers for sites, conservators behind the scenes, but a lot of front of house is actually volunteers, and that's the same for some local authority museums where you have volunteers helping to run events but also um, the independent sector is hugely reliant on volunteers Um, and you know in our region alone we've we've got 4,000 plus volunteers working in museums and and heritage sites just on our radar which is the accredited museums you know so we've got 116 accredited museums in our region the East Midlands as a whole and and you know that's a huge number of people giving their time and and they really have a mixture of roles you know a lot of people do work on events and running cafes and shops but you know even just welcoming people at the door or dealing with schools groups or um helping things to run behind the scenes setting up exhibitions doing social media you know um making things doing research you know managing collections, documentation, all sorts of stuff. And if you lose a huge proportion of that, it is going to have an impact on the visitor, but also on the sustainability of that organisation. But one of the things we know about our sector is that the majority of those volunteers are older people. So the report has really exposed that need for museums to, to think about diversity, you know, and they've actually acknowledged that. And that's been great because they've basically said, you know, we know that a lot of our volunteers were shielding or isolated during COVID and that we couldn't get people on site anyway. But they've, they've realised they need to adapt the offer. So, you know, they need to look at flexible forms of volunteering, whether that's micro volunteering opportunities where you just get a volunteer to come and do a specific task for you or a particular project or offering remote opportunities so that you can attract different types of people who don't want to be on site, who don't want to travel, or who maybe live quite a long way away but are really interested in your museum or or whatever it is, but, you know, could do something remotely, whether that's, you know, helping with your marketing or um, your collections documentation or whatever it is. There's, if there's thinking about those diversity of opportunities that have come out of this rather than, you know, the majority of volunteering opportunities up until COVID were on the site. So they expected people to be able to get to those sites, which immediately limits the pool of people that you can draw volunteers from. So the other thing, as I was talking about, you know, with age, is that 
that also reflects in your audiences. So the, the plan that a lot of museums are, are now formulating is to, to think about how they bring young people in, not just to you know, appeal to them as, as audiences and people to get through the door in that way, but to bring them in as volunteers so that they can adapt their offer to those young people because young people aren't going to be able to you know work in a museum in the same way as other people but they will then influence the direction of that organization because they'll bring in new thoughts fresh ideas and and ways of thinking about how young people might want to engage with that museum so so it's it's a win-win if if museums can diversify their volunteers um and, and covid has just really kind of put a focus on that need to think differently and, and how it's not just about the workforce that influences, but it's about the whole organisational approach. Right, well, that leads me perfectly to my final, my final question for you, really, uh, with our conversation, is the fact that this year's um, theme for International Museum Day uh, is recover and reimagine. And obviously, after this disruption, the great disruption of 2020, 2021, um, the sector will have to, yes, recover, reopen and, and, and all of the challenges that we've got there with being able to present the museum at its best, your, your, your museum as a volunteer in a way that also people want to come back to because one, you know, if they do come along and support it, they expect their cafe to be open if it was open last time or the children's mm -hmm. play area to be open if you're known for your children's play area. In five years time, do you think we will look back People in the, in the sector, um, specifically, mm. let's talk about the museum sector. Do you think people will look back and turn around and say, we actually do things better now because we were forced to engage um, a new way of looking at volunteering rather than it just being a traditional thing, which is like a book of volunteering opportunities. We had to reimagine it. We had to think about where our audience was from. Maybe we could go from being a local museum to an international museum by engaging social media more. Do you think? Do you think generally there will be a thought that in five years when they reflect back, it was a good time? It, it's helped the sector to keep going, because again, there's always that struggle, isn't it, about where the money's going to come from and stuff. Do you think it'll be a, seen as a positive thing? Yeah, I, I really do, John. I think it has, I think it has just pushed people forward, um, fast tracked the whole the whole sector in a lot of ways that people have talked about, you know, the, even the kind of working from home thing where we've all said for years, we were talking about how we didn't need to meet in person all the time. We could do things on Zoom or Teams or whatever. And but it was always this blocker because not everybody had done it before and all of that kind of thing. And I think that's the same for this sector is that sometimes there was that sense of we haven't tried that out before. So we're a bit reluctant. We're quite a risk averse sector. Um, but yeah, I think people will look will look back positively because they had to move forward they had to be fleet of foot to apply for the funding that was available because some organizations were about to tip over and fall off the cliff you know if they didn't get some emergency money that was available um, and they've done that they've proved to themselves that they can do that kind of fundraising some museums have had to really pick up their branding they've had to sell themselves get out there be demonstrating you know to different audiences that they're relevant and i think i think that's the word i always i always focus on relevance you know museums have to be relevant to survive and this whole period of time has made them you know in a lot of senses revisit that rethink about who they're for um and i think that's because they've been thinking well how can we reach people differently. We might have traditionally run a series of events and exhibitions at a site, but actually, how can we how can we do that differently? How can we start developing things online? How can we have more conversations through that online engagement? How can we be attractive when we reopen? Who are we, who are we wanting to get through the door when we reopen? Because the audience has changed. You're not necessarily going to get your international tourists coming to see, you know, Royal Crown Derby collection, but you might then start thinking, well, who is the audience? I need to make this collection and the stories relevant to a local audience or a family audience or, you know, young people who can find something in this, but maybe that's through a different approach and a different thinking. Um, so, so I think it has completely fast tracked 
you know, not only rethinking the purpose of museums, mm -hmm. but also some of the benefits of using technology and the fact that we can do it <laughs> rather than always being a bit reluctant. Yeah, I guess there's a lot of resilience will come out of it as well. And maybe I shouldn't have asked you about five years. Um, uh, maybe I was just thinking about both of us being able to answer that question in five years' time because we're still going around. But maybe in a hundred <laughs> years' time, you know, historians will look back and say actually the great disruption of 2020, 2021 was in fact that a lot more things survived in a way that was they started thinking about their relevance rather than rather than a badge of honour of still being there and surviving. The need mm -hmm. to collaborate, the need to communicate while they existed, stuff like that. You know, thinking creatively. Um, you know, how how are we going to um, uh, you know, critically think about the way that we do things, how would they change? I think, you know, that this is this has made people address some of those things that were maybe fringe, which is shall we have Instagram yeah. <laughs> to, to actually now be vital because it's well actually it's the only way we can show people our collections now because we've not been open. Exciting yeah. times really, but also you know like I said challenging and you know people losing their jobs and you know 22 percent of volunteers being lost will, will have an impact on um, some organizations but hopefully it, it, on the whole it will be building back um, in, in a much better stronger way do you think yeah totally I, th I think you're absolutely right and I thought it was really interesting what you said about building audiences more in a more dynamic way even you know in an international way because there's a, there's a couple of museums in our region one is Eam Museum Plague Village in, in uh, the Peak District um, who had not really a lot of social media engagement and really didn't do a lot online but they got a grant from us and they developed some ideas and they had a lot of interest from the media being a plague village during a pandemic so you know they had the history of the plague came to Derbyshire um, through a tailor from London bringing it during the the um, during the plague in London and um, Did bring how the they London variant? yes oh, yeah, yes yeah, yeah, absolutely right. <laughs> and then how they isolated so that it didn't spread and all of this they've got all that history and all the tragic stories about you know the, the impact of the village and the people in it but you know the media interest internationally was enormous so they really built on that by developing their social media by making their talks accessible by bringing in conversations across countries and across places and institutions to talk about you know the 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 common history and it's it's just it's just been enormous you know the shift from this tiny little museum to having you know having a very local relevance to suddenly having an international audience but but not just waiting for someone else to do that but actually embracing the opportunity and you know um developing their their online presence but um and also creswell crags is another one you know because they have the ice age story to tell with their prehistoric cave drawings and you know they they've again developed conversations and audiences with people all over the world what a lot of museums are struggling with is how to make money out of any of that so it's difficult isn't it when you create a service in a different way where you've got you haven't got a pay barrier you haven't got somebody giving you money to do that so that's a big issue um and when you talk about resilience that that will have to impact um on decision making that organizations take you know but i do think i do think the other thing that i, I won't forget to say is that how we run as museums should hopefully change as a result of this because if you look at the future and you know how we'll look back and say what changed i think for a lot of organizations they've realized that actually having the same people running an organization for 20 30 years is not the most healthy thing always it's about having the right people with the right skills because the, the pandemic showed that actually for a lot of organizations the board of trustees had to step up where it's a where it's an independent organization and there weren't necessarily the people who were willing to do the things that needed to be done to keep the organization alive to fundraise to do grant applications you know to, to build profile for the organization it's 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 having the right people and having a turnover of people that hopefully will shift as well so that we get that new blood in but we also have a bit more of a resilient approach to what skills we need to run organizations effectively and i'm sure if we speak again in a year's time 
uh, um, International Museum Day in 2022. Yeah. Some of that will have already started to play out, I think, because um, it needs to, isn't it? But if it opens yeah. up again, it will start playing out. So just finally, your website, um, mdem.org.uk. Yeah, it's a new, newly designed website. So very nice, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> I'm good. I hope you're going to say something good about it. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> but you're right, we're putting on our reports. And the other thing we do is we collect data about the museums in the region, break it down by county as well, um, so that you can get a snapshot of the economic impact um, of museums on the region, um, the number of volunteers, the number of people employed, that kind of thing. Um, so we collect that on an annual basis and that also informs our work so we can pick out trends, you know, and um, we do a health check with museums as well every year just to get them to start to identify their areas of need. So, you know, a big part of our role is constantly shaping our programming to respond to what those needs are. Yeah. I guess it's also saying to people, your museum needs you, go and visit, you know, because it's either yeah. put some money into it or maybe they need you because they don't realise the skills that you have because they're now for the first time willing to start embracing a volunteering opportunity in a very different way, which isn't you standing on the door, you know, and doing that kind of stuff. It might be just the fact that, you know, as, as an accountant or a solicitor or whatever, you've got, you know, the, the interest of being on the tr of being a trustee. But also maybe just your way of doing things that you do with the local school or the scout group. Just think about well, what can we do? I think all conversations yeah. are now back on the table, aren't they? Absolutely. And I'm really glad you, you said that because we, we've just been running a, a board succession planning programme. And at the start, the five, I think it's five or seven museums, I think it's seven, all started off saying this is really difficult we've tried for years to recruit new people but actually through a process of going through with them well what do you need what do you really need what roles do you need to fill what skills do you need what backgrounds do you need what thinking do you need it's not about going to people who are interested in the history of the, the town that the museum is focused on it is about those other skills you know and people who are enthusiastic enough to give a bit of the time but they've got maybe a background in finance or management or business or teaching or whatever it is it's it's yeah legal is a big one but it's it's looking for that diversity of, of skills and again about that diversity of input of of views um so you know finding a way one of the biggest problems with boards i think is they have a traditional way of meeting and communicating with one another and COVID has again shifted this because they've all had to meet online so they've become more efficient in their meetings they've been a bit more flexible about when they meet and that's much more attractive if you're younger if you've got a family you know if you've got caring responsibilities of any kind or you just don't want to meet in the evenings and go out of a winter's night to kind of go to some dark place and me you know it's, it's I'm, I'm not generalizing but you know what i mean it's, it's it's about thinking about if you're going to get the right people you've got to be flexible to what their needs are too so changing the culture a bit brilliant well listen claire thank you so much for taking the time to to speak to me today like i said it's um i know it's a busy time for you not normally but it's a busy yeah. time for you in 2021 yeah, it's well. nice um, fun. <laughs> yeah and wish you all the best and hopefully like i said you know we can plan to do this in a year's time and and just keep Doing what you do, but I mean your Twitter, you know, M U S D V E M News Dev East Midlands is a, is a great source of information for anybody. And obviously, check out the new the new website for you guys with the, with the brand and that. Brilliant. I'm certainly promoting the report to people. I think that's certainly something that Tina and I will do here at the Dot Media Centre to you know support in whichever way we can. And fingers crossed, the the, the, the sector starts building itself back. Brilliant. What you're doing, please. Yes. Well, if the Arts Council keeps funding us, we will. <laughs> we need a campaign to lobby the Arts Council to keep... We're, we're as reliant on funding as everyone else. <laughs> okay. People don't realise that kind of thing either, do they? They just assume it's, it's there and they take it for granted that it's going to survive forever. No, well, that's right. We're very, very uh, grateful to Arts Council for recognising the value of museum development. And they use us a lot. They, they consult with us. And the big thing that people don't see is that, that actually we're able to inform their policy decisions and their, and their funding by saying what it's like on the ground, you know, what's the reality of the situation in the East Midlands, so that they're not just producing stuff that is irrelevant for the sector. Um, so yeah, that we, we do have a, another role to kind of advocate back up. So 
Yeah, yeah, everybody's everybody. got a role to play, haven't they? they? They don't. It's not just go and visit. Sometimes it's talk about it and it be an ambassador for your local museum. Yeah. Advocacy for people to massive. visit. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. yeah. Well, thanks. Thank you. That was good. That was, that was a really interesting conversation with Claire, actually, just to kind of get behind the scenes a little bit, maybe, of, um, you know, what goes on in supporting museums and what they need. I think it's kind of linking, you know, you know what I'm really, really passionate about is people on the ground understanding how what they do fits into the bigger agenda, the bigger picture and the strategies and initiatives they feed into. And I think the team to Claire there just actually helps people understand that yeah we do have lots of volunteers and lots of goodwill from members of the public who actually give their time to run these museums and heritage locations but actually without the support of you know a body like Museum Development New Smithens you know it would be hard for those individuals to get the support in terms of everything that needs to be in place you know, the safeguarding, the health and safety, the risk assessments, all the legal stuff that actually prevents people from doing or doing this kind of stuff or even accessing or being able to visit. So I think from that point of view, I'm I'm a I'm a real big fan of actually kind of making sure that people understand that yeah, we do have a lot of museum and heritage locations, not just in the East Midlands, but across the whole country that are managed by volunteers, but actually there are these organisations, that these bodies of people, of experts, that are able to constantly keep their finger on the pulse, find out the needs of what those people need in order to have the skills and experience and attitudes to be able to make their museum relevant, you know, and then um, deliver the services that they do. But, I mean, there were so many things in Claire's interview that you could go on and talk about for ages. You could just talk about volunteers, you know, where do they come from, recruitment, retention, mm. you know, kind of constantly, you know, looking at your policies, policies to make volunteering appeal to people, you know, right down to people who are going to become your permanent chair of your museum. But then also to the other aspect of, having opportunities where people can just give 20 minutes of their time, you know, and that micro volunteering kind of aspect. But yeah, really interesting hearing the whole cultural change to the way in which people are working together and, you know, even the pest thing, who knew that one of the legacies <laughs> of COVID would be, you know, this increased knowledge of pest control in museums and, you know, how now, how for those smaller museums to better deal with that so you know really really interesting but yeah great um big fan of Claire's work and the work that they do it and um, let's just hope that the Arts Council continue to keep funding them yeah. that's the main thing isn't it okay so we're coming into the last sort of 15 minutes now <clears throat> so what I want to talk to you a little bit about is we've spoken about digital personas uh, at the beginning um, and as that as that particular project starts to to wind down and these young people go on to be volunteers and, 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 and stuff with it, with each of the museums and heritage locations. We've got a, a really interesting way of bringing it all together to create lots of content for those platforms. Tell us a little bit about, tell us a little bit about it. Let me tell you, let me say a little bit about Media Makers. Media Makers. Okay, really exciting little project. So Media Makers has actually been a project that's came out of, um, observations, conversations, and these very projects um, that, we've, that we've kind of touched on a little bit today. Um, in a nutshell, media makers are half a day sessions um, that are kind of designed by the Documentary Media Centre, um, where we will turn up with a group of young people and equipment at a museum venue, and we will make noise. So it is a great way of turning up concentrated period of time and young people carrying out interviews with staff and volunteers doing TikToks and Instagram reels, taking photographs and box pots, just generating lots and lots of content that then can be put out across social media platforms 
to just make concentrated noise about a particular venue, a particular museum or heritage location in a real creative way. So just a different approach to that being creative, bringing something that will help a museum to showcase, highlight, scream and shout about what it does in really creative ways through engaging opportunities for young people. Yeah. Okay, so is that kind of creating an body of content in a quite concentrated period of time that can then be used through an existing digital persona? Yeah, it could be or? used for, um, to be given, to be put into a package and given back to the museum in terms of film files, imagery, content that they can use across their own social media platforms. But again, the real reasoning behind the project was to help our young people, our digital curators, um, linked to the Digital Persona project, actually curate um, content that they then can use to power their platforms. So I think really, really fun project. Um, again, media makers are about young people turning up with equipment and making a coordinated amount of noise across social media platforms about museum and heritage locations. And we're going to be delivering six um, in partnership with the Y Heritage and Haley um, at the Y is going to be working with myself and the young people on coordinating those sessions. So we're going to have lots and lots of fun. I actually think the first media maker session is on the Saturday, the 26th of June, out in Church Langton at St. Peter's Church with our digital persona lead out there, Francis. So, and I didn't even have that written down. So how good is that? Yeah. She carries it all in her head, <laughs> terrifying. You know. um, okay, so let's let's move on to the to the final thing uh, we want to talk about today. Really, is um, you know having been in and around for the last sort of you know 10, 12 years with everything we've done from Citizens Eye, What Box, having the What Space at the High Cross, the Somewhere Two contract, working with the Mighty Creatives with their journals project, visiting Canons Ashby and making all of those films and stuff. Um, some of which we were looking at earlier on YouTube and um, young people that are sort of in their early 20s now were all sort of, <laughs> sort eight, of and nine. eight and nine was quite scary and uh, but we look the same though so that's all right that's okay um it was interesting looking at some of that stuff and it really realized the amount of work that we've done in and around the museum and heritage sector and obviously running an independent museum ourselves that what we'd thought about really was how we could engage people, but maybe more in that storytelling, the storytelling aspect of it. And I suppose we've been banging our heads together quite a lot uh, over lockdown and kind of came up with this new uh, concept for a content management system that we could share with people uh, called Museo. So do you want to tell us a little bit about that or should I play the little the little promo first? What should oh, I, I think you should play the little play promo. Play the little promo first. Yeah, so and then we'll have a bit of a... Yeah. This appeared. This appeared in our inboxes last night from our partners, um, seventeen fourteen, which was fantastic. So, um, thanks to those guys for creating this for us. It's only fifty seconds long, but it gives us an opportunity to reflect back on it, which is good. That's good. It's always good to see a project come to life like that, isn't it? It's it's great. It's been great working with the guys at seventeen fourteen, um, Kyle, Josh, and James, and James um, on de on developing the project and you know, drawing on their various years of knowledge as well between all of them when it comes to creating the content. So tell us a little bit uh, about Musea. 
a little bit about where where the concept yeah, came from. Came I can't from. even thought behind it. So was it my idea? No, oh, definitely okay, not. Um, so Museo was a bit of an idea I had, um, which we which came from one our kind of understanding and and the need to kind of um, create a creative tool that can help these very museums and heritage locations that we're talking about. So. The concept of museo was not about big flashy Tate Modern, the British Museum, because they have massive big marketing budgets, you know, and they have lots and lots of capacity to be able to kind of spend time on their digital offer and the way in which they um, create their exhibitions to be interactive and engaging. Um, museo Reela is um, a content management tool that has been designed to become a platform that small museum and heritage locations could use to, um, if you like, bring to life um, their artifacts and objects and exhibitions um, through creative uses of QR codes, which we know through the pandemic have been given a rebirth and everybody- Yeah, so it's kind of come back to life again. Everybody loves QR codes again. So Museo, mm. in a nutshell, has been designed um, for young people and older people, um, volunteers with very little knowledge of how to um, program content and schedule dynamic content. So for those of people that know me, they will have known that I managed the High Cross Beacons for a number of years. And um, these are those digital light sculptures outside the showcase cinema. Yes. So as part of that role, um, I, on a day to day basis, managed and scheduled all the content that played on those um, on the platform. So when people came to the shopping centre, the things, the, the digital imagery and films and artwork that were actually presented on a day to day basis were scheduled by a content management system. Now, with that kind of background and understanding, because I'm not techie, and if anybody told me 20 years ago, I would be managing the content for a very, very expensive um, platform for pu public engagement, I would have gone, you're, good, you're off your rocker. I won't be able to <laughs> do that at all. But from somebody with no kind of knowledge and background of managing content management systems, being able to work with local creatives, get films and digital content, upload it to a content management system, and then say, right, well, I want this to play from one o'clock till two o'clock on Wednesday, then I want it to change to this piece of content. Kind of got me thinking, wouldn't it be great if we had a platform that museums and heritage locations could identify a number of artifacts and actually build up lots of dynamic content that sat behind them. So just say, for instance, and I'll go back to my um, example earlier on, the dinosaur at Newport Museum. So just say, for instance, we wanted to bring the dinosaur to life a little bit more uh, in a creative way. What you could do is give um, the dinosaur its very own new, unique QR code and access to Museo. So the people at the museum or the people who were curating the exhibitions could actually upload a number of pieces of information, film, audio, imagery that actually could be changed, dynamically changed on a regular basis um, to actually make objects and artifacts that little bit more engaging. Um, and we spoke to a few young people about it, which they thought was an absolute great idea. So we spoke to the guys at 1715 and excitedly, we are now at the point where we're going to be launching Museo but it has come, it is kind of gone on a bit of its own journey. So our original thought process was a simple to use content management system designed with the user in mind to be to enable anybody to sit at one screen and schedule content without leaving the platform in a real simple way. Um, 
now involving our digital curators and our young people and actually showing them insights into museo and getting their ideas they've actually come back and gone but tina this is not just okay for museums and it could be done it's great for nature trails it's great for um outdoor festivals and really really caught my imagination in terms of do you know what actually the original idea we had for it yeah there's a real big need for that but it can be used in so many creative ways mm -hmm. so in a nutshell museo is a simple content management system designed for any one of those museums that we spoke about and touched on today but all of those um, museums that are actually running on a lot of goodwill and volunteer um, power and enthusiasm, if you like, to be able to enhance their offer and the way in which visitors interact. And I suppose for those people who are still listening that listened to Tom's interview earlier on, a bit of a nod to those repeat visitors and the immediate ability to be able to dynamically change or target um, content that sits behind um, QR codes to particular visitors. So just say, for instance, if you're having a primary school visit in the morning, you could tailor content to that age group and then dynamically change that back to original content for the rest of the afternoon when you're normally open to the public. So yeah, I'm quite excited about it and I can't wait to start talking to museums and getting um, some of the museo content um, off the ground with some of our digital and some of the media maker sessions that we've got that are coming up as well the one that you mentioned there will be about creating content in order to start that because we're going to be trialing museo over the summer with various venues and stuff so that's really, really I'm, I'm really excited about it and i am sure that as we move through the summer um, we're going to be working with quite a few venues that will see the benefit and um, beauty of Museo and hopefully it will help enhance some of those locations and artifacts and objects. Brilliant, um, thank you uh, for those people that have been watching and listening, hopefully you've get an opportunity to, a few people have asked some questions and interacted and sent us emails while we've been online as well which is great. Um, feel, if you watch this again, feel free to share it with anybody you think might be of uh, interest, either as a young person that's interested in becoming a digital curator like Lucy and Bethany. Um, venues like Moira Furness and um, the Loughborough Carillon that you, you maybe you volunteer at already or you know the people that are volunteering there, uh, having a chat about how they can revamp or maybe reimagine uh, recover and then reimagine they're using using the international museum day theme um, their own volunteering strategy maybe through to people that might be interested in uh, just getting in touch with us here at the dot media center on uh, dot media center.org or on our twitter and facebook um, at dot media center or instagram uh, just, just get in touch final final thoughts i was just going to say if there's anybody out there who's really interested in finding out more about museums we did a very good MOOC, didn't we, um, oh, yeah. a while back. Yeah, one um, of these through... massive open online courses, wasn't it? Yeah. Future Learn ran it. It was really interesting. Was it behind the scenes of the 21st century museum? And that yeah. was a great way of actually looking at how museums all across the world and the UK are actually designed with the visitor in mind um, and kind of ticks on a lot of those things. If people are interested in kind of finding out more, learning more, um, I would say that MOOC is a really good kind of um, way of introducing yourself or learning more about museums of the future and um, what museums are actually up to under that umbrella. But also, if there are people out there who think, you know what, I'd love to volunteer at my local museum, I'd say get in touch with them. You know, they've all got websites. They all have community engagement leads and persons staff with a remit to engage with those very people and to develop opportunities so i would say if if you're up for getting involved in volunteering get in touch but also if you have an idea for an exhibition or you know you want to engage more in your museums you know go and approach them go and get in touch with them because by the very nature museums are 
more than just museums. Go and have a conversation. Yeah. Go and visit. Go and visit your local museum. Show your support. Yeah. Um, the three interviews that um, we've shown today in their entirety, which is pretty rare for a newsroom because we normally do clips. So actually to show all three of them just shows you the quality of how good they were when, when we captured them over the last couple of weeks. Um, will be posted on the Facebook page later on today. And also everything has been um, collated and curated into a flipboard magazine by Tina um, about uh, International Museum Day today. And then we'll start to have more information about Museo and collect all of the stuff from the visits to media makers and digital persona sessions. So thanks very much for uh, watching us and getting involved. It's great to be doing a newsroom about something that um, it's about us as well here at the dot media so that's pretty rare we normally host these museum um, newsrooms for everybody else to actually do one about something that we're really passionate about and sitting in one as well pretty cool so thank you very much speak to you soon